In the world of aviation, there's always been a fine line between not having enough power and having far too much. A fighter that can't climb fast enough, can't shoot hard enough, or simply can't keep up with its enemies is doomed from the start. But push too far in the other direction, and you risk creating a machine that looks perfect on paper yet collapses under its own weight. That balance between speed, firepower, and control decided the fate of countless designs during World War II. Think about it. In 1918, 6.30 caliber machine guns would make an aircraft a fortress in the sky. By 1940, the same armament was little more than dead weight. On the engine side, a few hundred horsepower was enough in World War I. But in the Second World War, fighters demanded more than a thousand. Too weak, and the aircraft was useless. Too strong, and the airframe itself could be torn apart by the very power meant to make it invincible. That's where our story begins. With an American design that promised the moon, but proved the danger of asking for too much. The Lockheed XP-49. By the spring of 1939, the U.S. Army Air Corps was looking toward the horizon with urgency. War clouds were gathering over Europe, and American planners knew that the next generation of fighters would need to climb higher, fly faster, and hit harder than anything then in service. On March 11th, the Army issued Circular Proposal 39-775, a call for a new twin-engine high-performance interceptor. This wasn't meant to be a clean-sheet design. The Army wanted something practical, an aircraft built from an existing framework but modified to handle more powerful engines. The idea was simple. Why waste years reinventing the wheel when promising fighters were already taking shape? The new requirement also specified tricycle landing gear, a forward-thinking choice for better stability and ground handling. Four companies stepped forward. Grumman submitted a derivative of its odd but effective XF-5F Skyrocket. Belanca and Bernelli offered designs that quickly faded into obscurity. And then there was Lockheed. Fresh from the drawing board with its radical twin-boom P-38 Lightning, the company saw an opportunity to push the concept even further. What resulted was Model 222, the seed that would grow into the XP-49, a fighter that, at least on paper, promised to leap ahead of the era. Lockheed's Model 222 was, in many ways, a P-38 Lightning taken to the extreme. At first glance, the airframe looked familiar. The same twin-boom silhouette, the central nacelle, the elegant sweep of the wings. But inside, the changes were dramatic. The cockpit was to be pressurized, a rare luxury in 1939, allowing pilots to fight comfortably at high altitude. Fuel capacity would be stretched to roughly 300 gallons, giving the interceptor longer legs than its lightning sibling. And the armament, already impressive on the prototype P-38, was slated for a serious upgrade. 4.50 caliber Browning machine guns paired with two 20 millimeter cannons, all concentrated in the nose. Against bombers of the day, that kind of firepower would have been devastating. But the heart of the proposal lay in its engines. The standard P-38 used Allison V-1710s producing about 1,000 horsepower each. Model 222 promised something far bolder, Pratt & Whitney's experimental X1-800 inline, rated at 2,000 horsepower, or Wright's Radical R2-160, capable of 2,300. With either choice, Lockheed predicted top speeds between 473 and 500 miles per hour. Remember, this was 1939. Speeds like that wouldn't become reality for piston fighters until the very end of the war. On paper, the XP-49 looked unstoppable. Bigger guns, more fuel, and engines that promised to make it one of the fastest propeller-driven fighters ever built. It seemed Lockheed had found a way to take the Lightning's innovative design and turn it into something truly extraordinary. The brilliance of Model 222 lay in its promise, but that promise quickly revealed a hidden flaw. The proposed engines were simply too powerful for the P-38's basic frame. 
To squeeze out 2,000 to 2,300 horsepower from each nacelle meant larger dimensions, more weight, and far more torque than the Lightning's structure was designed to absorb. Torque, in particular, was a nightmare. On a small, light fighter, such force could twist the airframe or make control unpredictable. Even with counter-rotating propellers canceling some of the effect, the strain would still ripple through the wings and fuselage. Reinforcing the structure was possible, but that meant more weight, and every pound robbed the aircraft of the very speed those engines were supposed to deliver. And then, there was reality. Neither the X-1800 nor the R-2160 was ready for production. They were still experimental, plagued with delays and reliability issues. By early 1940, it became clear that waiting for them was a dead end. Lockheed and the Army had little choice but to scale back. Instead of the monster engines, the XP-49 would be fitted with Continental's I-1430, an ambitious hyper-engine, producing about 1,600 horsepower. It was less dramatic, but at least it was real. Still, the downgrade dropped the projected top speed from nearly 500 miles per hour to about 458. The XP-49 was still promising, but its dream of being the ultimate lightning had already dimmed. Once the decision was made to switch to the Continental I-1430, the XP-49 could finally move forward, or at least that was the idea. In truth, progress crept along at a frustrating pace. Lockheed's engineers were still knee-deep in the lightning program, refining the P-38 for combat service. The new project, so similar in appearance, was often pushed to the sidelines. Even with 66% of its components borrowed directly from the P-38, the XP-49 didn't come together quickly. Through most of 1940, little more than drawings and mock-ups existed. By mid-1941, a full-scale model was finally ready, and in late August, the Army gave its approval to proceed with an actual prototype. On paper, the XP-49 looked only slightly larger than the Lightning. The fuselage stretched about 40 feet long with a wingspan of just over 52 feet. Empty, it tipped the scales at nearly 19,000 pounds, roughly a thousand heavier than its sibling. Stronger engines meant heavier nacelles, reinforced landing gear, and improved fireproofing, all of which added bulk. But the real bottleneck wasn't Lockheed's shop floor. It was the Continental engine itself. The I-1430 was a bold design, promising high output from a compact package. Yet Continental was a small company, working with limited resources. Development dragged on, year after year, while Lockheed's completed airframe sat waiting. By late 1941, the XP-49 was ready to fly, except for the fact it had no engines to lift it from the runway. At long last, in April 1942, Lockheed finally received a pair of Continental I-1430 engines. Even then, red tape slowed things further. The engines weren't cleared for flight, so the finished XP-49 sat idle, waiting on paperwork. Seven long months passed before the aircraft finally took to the skies. On November 11, 1942, nearly three years after the contract was signed, the XP-49 made its first flight. At first, it seemed like the wait had been worth it. Handling was smooth, not far removed from the familiar P-38. Test pilots noted that the twin-boom fighter felt stable and predictable, though they recommended a slightly larger vertical tail for better control. Fuel system quirks caused some headaches, but otherwise the initial flights looked promising. That optimism didn't last. After less than two weeks, the prototype was grounded to swap in stronger versions of the I-1430 engines, along with new self-sealing fuel tanks and a second seat for an onboard engineer. When the XP-49 returned to the air in December, gremlins began to appear. Hydraulic failures plagued the controls, making mock combat and high-speed runs nearly impossible. The new year brought disaster. On January 1, 1943, 
A combined electrical and hydraulic failure shut down one engine in mid-flight. With control systems barely functioning, the pilot wrestled the fighter into a rough emergency landing. The damage was repairable, but it underscored how fragile the project really was. By February, the tail had been enlarged by 8 inches and the aircraft returned to flight. In June, it was handed over to Wright Field for Army testing. But more problems followed, this time fuel leaks that forced yet another grounding. Each fix brought new delays, while confidence in the XP-49 continued to erode. By mid-1943, the Army's patience with the XP-49 had worn thin. What had once looked like a leap into the future was now just an underwhelming shadow of the lightning it was meant to surpass. The final blow wasn't a single crash or dramatic failure. It was progress elsewhere. The Allison V-1710 engines powering the standard P-38 had steadily improved. By 1943, they were producing horsepower equal to, or even greater than, the troublesome Continental I-1430s. The Lightning, lighter and already proven in combat, simply outperformed its so-called successor. The XP-49, once projected to hit 458 miles per hour, could manage barely 406. Meanwhile, the production P-38J was faster, more reliable, and already rolling off assembly lines in quantity. The Army knew where its priorities lay. Resources were better spent refining and building the aircraft already winning battles overseas, not propping up an experimental design that offered less. The XP-49 was quietly downgraded in priority, shuffled to the back of the line. It flew only a handful more times. Eventually, Engineers used it for stress tests, even dropping it from a crane to simulate a brutal landing. By 1946, the prototype was scrapped, leaving behind little more than photographs, reports, and a lesson in ambition gone astray. For Lockheed, the message was clear. If you want to harness engines that powerful, you need a whole new airframe to carry them. That idea would resurface later in the massive XP-58 chain lightning, but the XP-49's brief career had already closed. The Lockheed XP-49 was born from ambition, an attempt to leap ahead of the times with engines that promised nearly impossible speed. Yet in chasing that dream, it fell victim to a cruel irony. What looked unstoppable on paper became a machine too powerful for its own good and too late to matter once the lightning itself grew into the fighter it was meant to replace. That's the true lesson of the XP-49. More power isn't always better. Without the right balance of structure, weight, and reliability, horsepower can become a curse instead of a blessing. Lockheed learned this the hard way. To handle the next generation of engines, they had to go bigger, heavier, and stronger, which is why the XP-58 followed as an entirely different beast. But the XP-49 still holds a place in history, not as a war hero, but as a cautionary tale. It reminds us that technology advances in steps, not leaps. Push too far, too fast, and even the most promising ideas can stumble. For those of us who love classic warbirds, the XP-49 sparks a different kind of admiration. It never won glory in combat, but it tells a story of innovation, frustration, and the eternal quest for speed. Do you remember first learning about this forgotten lightning? Share your thoughts below. We'd love to hear them. And if this story brought back your love of these remarkable machines, don't forget to like, subscribe, and join us again. Because the journey through America's aviation past is far from over.